As an opportunity to renew what God gave us in baptism, renew our spirits and our minds to see ourselves in light of what God has done for us there, we take time in worship for confession and absolution to die to our sin, which has been forgiven us in our baptism, and to rise to a new life with Jesus as he raised us up out of the water. We begin then as the way, in the way that our life in Christ began with an invocation in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We take some time of silent reflection on that word of God. Now let us confess our sins to God the Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you give you thanks. We praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Father, Amen. 
Lord be with you. And let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who governs all things in heaven and on earth, mercifully hear the prayers of your people and grant us your peace through all our days. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated as we hear from God's Word. The Old Testament reading for the third Sunday after the Epiphany is from Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 1 to 3, 5 to 6, and then concluding with verses 8 to 10. All the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate, and they told Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read it from it, facing the square before the water gate, and from early morning until midday, in the presence of all the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And as he opened it, all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. They read for the book, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest the sc and scribe, and the, and the Levites, who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, <coughs> and drink sweet wine, and spend portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the, Lord, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, to, be God. to God. The epistle is from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning at verse 12, and concluding on the first part of verse 31. For just as the body is one, and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body. That will make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body. For that will not make it any less part of the body. But if the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need for you, nor again to the head to the feet, I have no need for you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor, and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God 
has so composed the body, giving honor to the part that lacked it, that there be there may be no division in the body, but that the members that have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers? Do we all work miracles? Do we all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the higher gifts. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the fourth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly, I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heavens were shut up for three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land, and Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath, to the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the patriarch Elisha, and none of them were cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath, and they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We confess our faith with Christians all over the world. Let's use the Apostles' Creed to do it. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. 
The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Hey, worship team, before you start this next yep. song, you know the story behind this song? Are you familiar with no, this at all? Sure. Do you know the yeah. story? I'm so sure. there was a congregation, and I don't know where they were, but they were going through a period of self-assessment as a congregation. They were trying to figure out what is God calling us toward, and what are we to do as a worshiping community and as a serving community. And what they found was that they needed to make some significant changes to what they were doing in worship so that they could meet another generation of people and give the good news of Jesus to them. Because what they were doing was serving them just fine, but not this next generation. That stirred up a whole lot of arguments, you could imagine, right? Everybody had an opinion, and they were strong opinions. So you know what they did? They stripped everything away from worship. Every song, every instrument, every tradition they had, they took it all away. And I think they did it for like a year. But they just came together for the Word of God. That would be so strange to us, right? And then on the Sunday, when they were ready to start building back, this was their first song. Thanks for sharing that. When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come. Longing just to bring something that's of worth, that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things appear, you're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. King of endless worth, no one could express how much you deserve. Though I'm weak and poor, all I I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things appear, you're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you, it's all about you. I was preparing for a pastoral ministry, we had a seasoned seminary professor who had been out in the field and pastored churches for a long time, and he, uh, he gave us this wise advice. He said, good preaching covers a multitude of sins. I think the point that he was getting at is, you might not be the end-all, be-all of pastors, but if you take the preaching task seriously, and strive to do well at it, <laughs> it's amazing what people might put up with, <laughs> because at least that part is honed in. Now, 
That said, I also know the story of another pastor who actually was quite a dud when it came to preaching. He wasn't really gifted there, but he was gifted at listening, praying, counseling, calling, showing up, and caring for others, like few pastors ever do. And that congregation was able to look past the poor preaching because they knew that they had this pastor's weight in gold, and they were willing to put up with a poor sermon on occasion, or even with frequency, because they were being loved so well through this pastor. For some, a good sermon is more about length than content. Some consider a sermon good more because of the style than the content. Good to some people is when the sermon releases them, but another person might think a sermon is good because it convicts them. Sometimes I've had people walk out of church and say, that sermon really convicted me. And I think, oh no. If that's all that sermon did was make you feel bad, then we didn't get the job done when we were in there. I mean, there might have been something that convicted you, that made you feel bad, that you helped, rec helped you recognize your sin. But if you didn't recognize your Savior too, if all we did was convict you, we better go back inside and restart that sermon, give you some more minutes. There's a great example in Luke chapter 4 of Jesus preaching. A really good sermon. And I mean it was a good sermon. It's the kind of sermon that people have looked back on over the generations. We've looked back into Luke chapter 4 to hear what Jesus said in the synagogue of Nazareth, and we've gained from it. We learn some new things from it, and, and we grow because we listen to the words that were coming out of Jesus' mouth that day. But that good sermon was not well received, which reminds me that a good sermon is not just based on what's coming out of the preacher's mouth, but what's happening once those words have reached the listener's ears. I know one pastor, when he would stand at the door and people would come to him and say, good sermon, pastor, he would say, well, that remains to be seen. <laughs> kind of depends on what you do with it once you leave here, right? So, Jesus preaches his good sermon, and at first, the people in the synagogue of his hometown receive his words well. They actually marvel at the gracious words that were coming out of his mouth. Isn't this Joseph's son? They're, they're excited about what they hear him say. He's preaching from Isaiah chapter 61. He is the Lord's anointed, and this passage, he says, is being fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus has come to be the fulfillment of this scripture, in fact, of all scripture, including that place where it says a prophet is without honor in his hometown. Now, the people, at first, love what they hear from Jesus, but by the end of the sermon, they're enraged. They no longer think this is a good sermon. They take this good preacher out of town and to the brow of the hill that their town is built on in order to throw him off the cliff. This is every preacher's worst nightmare. Actually, I've not had a worse nightmare like that. I've had other nightmares about preaching. I've preached other nightmare sermons, but... I've never thought that people would take me to the brow of a hill and throw me off because of what I had to say. They did that to Jesus. So what does that tell us about a good preacher? Good preachers aren't always well received. A sermon might be good, but yet it's not heard in a good way. So part of the preaching task is what comes out of the pastor's mouth, and part of the preaching task is what happens in the people's hearts. Their hearts weren't ready for this. And I don't have much doubt to think that Jesus knew exactly how to press them, what buttons to press. One preacher preached a stewardship sermon. Stewardship is often those sermons where we talk about money, right, and about giving and how to be more generous. And those are not the sermons that are most prone to be considered good, <laughs> as you can imagine. But on one occasion, a pastor found that preaching about money and generosity led a lot of people to stir up with some anger. And 
somebody reasoned with that pastor and said it's a little bit like bringing somebody to a doctor's examination table. A doctor is going to poke and prod and tap, and they're going to push some buttons. And what they're looking for sometimes is reaction. Does this hurt? Do you feel this? Do you feel, oh, yeah, oh, see now, that's where the problem is. Sometimes God's word is as exacting as a doctor's medical instruments to find out where the trouble is. Where has sin taken over a heart? Where has sin uh, built a, a, a castle and, and fortification so that nobody can get in? And so a good sermon might route that stuff out. So there are plenty of cases where people might flock to hear good sermons because they've heard the reputation of a good preacher, that this preacher or that preacher really gives good messages, and so people come to check it out. And actually, sometimes preachers can gather quite a group of people around them just because they're gifted at giving sermons. That doesn't necessarily mean that the sermons are good, though. Some preachers tend to gather crowds because who doesn't love to hear a message that inspires, that excites, but beware. Beware the good preaching that isn't always good. Inspiring and exciting is not the same as evangelizing. Sometimes what's wrong with a sermon is not what was said in the sermon, but what was left unsaid in the sermon. When a sermon is inspiring and exciting, but is void of Jesus and his cross and his resurrection, that sermon which might hit the ears well has done nothing for the heart. That sermon is void of Jesus. Now, would we call that sermon good? Easy on the ears, no doubt. But did you get the gospel? Sometimes a good sermon isn't really that good because the preacher doesn't practice what he preaches. Maybe a good sermon only sounds good because it scratches the ears, it scratches an itch. Uh, St. Paul warned us about this. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, he said, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. You see, sometimes we have a scratch or an itch that we want scratched. We, we want a preacher to tell us certain things so that we feel like we're in the right, and then we can feel better about ourselves and our positions and our takes on life. We can easily fall into this temptation. We want the preacher to preach against the sins that plague society, You know, the ones that show up in politics and on news channels and on Facebook feeds. We want a hot take on hot topics. We want something that's applicable to contemporary matters. But really, what we may be wanting is someone to agree with what our minds are already agreed upon. We want someone to tell us that God's on our side on this matter. And then we'll be relieved And we'll be courageous, and we'll know that God agrees with us. So, beware of someone who scratches that itch, of someone who tells you what you were hoping to hear. Jesus gave the people of Nazareth the truest, purest, most faithful interpretation of Scripture, and yet they hated him for it. It's possible for somebody to give a poor, unfaithful interpretation of Scripture, and yet people love the preacher for it. So why did they hate Jesus' message? Why did they hate Jesus there in Nazareth? I think the reason is because he contradicted their beliefs. They had no room for repentance, no soft spot in their hearts to hear and adjust their beliefs based on God's revelation. They decided they would be right, and even if God himself should show up in our midst and contradict us, he would be wrong. (laughs) 
And that's actually exactly what was happening. God had shown up in their midst and was contradicting their convictions. And they were sure he was wrong for it. Do you have heartfelt beliefs? Which you are willing to die on a hill for? Do you have heartfelt beliefs that even if Jesus were to come and contradict you over those, you really wouldn't want to hear it from even Jesus? I think sometimes we have those. See, what Jesus saw in those people, they didn't even see in themselves. Jesus saw that those people in his hometown had a sinful passion. And their sinful passion was called national pride. National pride. They were patriotic people, but beyond patriotism, they were nationalists. They were ethnocentrists. They were racial supremacists. They believed their people were the best that could be found, and other people were inconsequential. They were xenophobic. Recognize that word? That's been thrown around a lot in the past years. Xenophobic. It comes from two Greek words, xenos, which means other, and phobic or phobia, which means fear. So it's a fear of other peoples. So when people raise up a question and say, you're xenophobic, they're saying, ah, you're just afraid of other people. You're afraid of new people, that kind of thing. That's what they mean by xenophobic. These people were. In Nazareth, they were xenophobic. And Jesus knew that about them, and so he pressed them on it. And in his sermon, after they were taking his words so well, he switched gears. He said, a prophet's not acceptable in his own town. Here, I'll prove it. <laughs> and then he started talking to them about Gentiles, about xenos, right? About other people. He told them about the ministry of Elijah the prophet. During the three, and a, three years and six-month famine, when there were a lot of widows in Israel that didn't have food or water, but who was Elijah sent to? The woman at Zarephath. And he helped her. Or the ministry of Elisha. When there were a lot of lepers around Israel, but who was the one that received cleansing from Elisha? It was a Syrian general. The opposing army's lead commander. He got cleansing, not the lepers of Israel. And so Jesus, pointing this out showed them that God was concerned for others, not fearful of others. Now, I would liken this, perhaps, to some of the attitudes that we have as Americans, as Christians, some of the attitudes that circulate in our circles when it comes to the U.S. border. Okay, hang on now. Stick with me on this. Please don't jump to a conclusion here. Have the goodwill to hear me for what I am saying, not to hear what I am not saying. But I think that if Jesus were to come to some of our churches and tell us that we are to welcome everyone streaming through the southern border, okay, maybe with the exclusion of some criminals, all right, but if we should welcome people coming in through southern borders by clothing them, feeding them, educating their children, treating them like they are fellow citizens, even though they're not, I think even if Jesus were to say that to us, there would be some of us who would find that revolting. There would be some of us who might think twice about putting something in the offering. There would be some of us who might think twice about coming back next week if Jesus himself were to come and say that. On the other hand, if Jesus were to stand up before us in some of our Christian churches and say to us that pre-born people are indeed human and that their lives all of their lives, ought to be protected, not aborted. I think that a number of our U.S. Christians in our churches might find that revolting. 
and might stand up and even walk out, might think twice about putting something in the offering, might think twice about coming back the next week. You see, the problem, when we find ourselves holding on to positions, is that when God's voice goes against the position, we might tend to go against God's voice. We lock on to our positions so firmly that even if God himself were to show up in our midst and tell us to believe something other than what we've been believing, we might not listen to even God's voice on the matter. If your political persuasion leads you to a Jesus who confirms pretty much everything that your political party adheres to, there's a really good chance that you have crafted a Jesus that is unlike the real Jesus. That you have made a Jesus into your own image. Whereas the purpose of the word of God is to transform us so that we conform more and more to the image of Christ. I don't know about masks. Now, hang on. Stick with me here. I'm not a medical expert. I don't study virology. I don't know how good they are to protect us. Some of you are much better with science than I'll ever be. I might need to listen to you on this one. Here's the thing about masks. I think, maybe, that if Jesus himself were to come into our midst and tell us, y'all should put masks on your face, there are some of us who would find that quite revolting. And I think that if Jesus were to show up and tell us, what are y'all doing with masks on your face? I think some of us would find that very revolting. I cannot tell you which message I think Jesus would give about masks. I don't know what he would say about vaccines or boosters either. I don't know if he would tell us, look folks, live by faith, not by fear. Live in the liberty that I've given you with the gospel. Or if he would tell us, you know that part in the New Testament that says obey your governing authorities? I actually meant it. I'm not sure which take Jesus would give to us. I really don't know. There's a great word for this. I think this falls into this category. The word is adiophora. You ever heard the word adiophora before? Okay, a few of you have. Not many. Adiophora. We should just know this word. This should be part of our vocabulary as a church, okay? We should know cool words from other languages Makes us feel cool about ourselves. Okay, well, try it with me anyway. Adiophora, let's say it together. One, two, three, adiophora. Okay, now, better know the meaning of that word, right? Where there are tongues, there should be interpretations. <laughs> adiophora means something that is neither commanded nor condemned in Scripture. Something that is neither commanded nor condemned in Scripture. Now, usually when it comes to adiophora, we think about things in the worship life of the congregation. For example, a pastor's robe, this alb, this is adiaphora. The scriptures don't command me to wear this. They don't condemn me for wearing it either. You know what that means? I can make up my mind about whether this is a helpful tool in communicating the good news of Jesus or not. I can show up with it on or with it off. Does that make sense? Neither commanded nor condemned in scripture. The playing of a guitar or the playing of an organ? Neither commanded nor condemned in Scripture, although I think you could make the case that in the Psalms there's something about stringed instruments, just saying. <laughs> but neither commanded nor condemned in Scripture. We can use it, we cannot use it. Whatever helps us best proclaim the good news of Jesus. Makes sense, right? I think there are adiaphoran that follow us in the other areas of life too. I can't give you the scripture's take on vaccines, boosters, or masks because the scriptures don't tell us expressly what God has to say about those things. Can we make some conclusions based on our reading of scripture? Sure. 
a lot of you have done that, right? That's led you to two different places, perhaps. Here's the thing. In 5, 15, or 50 years, I might be led to believe that my reaction to all of those topics and what I chose to do in the midst of this confusing time was dead wrong. That's a possibility, isn't it? Have you ever thought about the possibility that you might be wrong with what you're doing right now? Not about the fact that somebody else might be wrong, but that you might be wrong? That's true for us. We might be wrong about our reactions to certain things. Here's the thing about the offering. We sometimes just have to make a choice. Go with it and rely on the grace of God down the road. My brother-in-law this morning preached his last sermon at a church that he's been serving for 12 years in Columbus, Nebraska. Some of you might remember a video that I did with the, ser- with the church behind me when I was out of town, and I, gave a, I literally phoned my sermon in that Sunday. I had that in the background. They're moving tomorrow. He received a call to a congregation elsewhere in Nebraska. Well, God didn't directly tell him through the scriptures, you have to stay or you have to leave kind of left that to my brother-in-law and my sister to figure it out for themselves. So which one would be the sinful choice? Maybe neither is sinful. Maybe what they'll discover down the road is that by leaving and going to a new congregation, it was a poor choice. It was a train wreck for this church and for that church and for their family. Or maybe they'll discover down the road that leaving was the best thing they could have done for the church they were currently at and the church they were going to and their family and community. I don't know which one it'll be, but here's what we do know. When God neither commands nor condemns, and we have to make a choice, and God gives us the freedom for that decision, down the road, God is gracious. God is gracious. We do our best to love our neighbors, those close to us, and those other than us. We do our best to love them. We make choices. We walk down that road trusting That if in 5, 15, or 50 years I'm proven to be dead wrong, my God will be there to forgive me and love me and restore me. Or if in 5, 15, and 50 years I'm down the road and I realize that was a really helpful choice for others and for me, then I'll recognize God's grace in the whole process. We make decisions that affect other people. We have to have them in mind. And by other people, I mean some other other people. Sometimes, in making our decisions, we come out on the wrong side of history. Sometimes on the right. I don't know how your choices compare. I don't know how in 5, 15, or 50 years you'll look back and think, yep, I really had some wisdom back then in 2022. Or, my goodness, I was such a fool in 2022, I had no idea. Or maybe you still won't know. But I know this. God will be there for you, and he'll be gracious. This is the same God who came into the midst of the Nazareth synagogue and preached that the scriptures will be fulfilled in their hearing. He's the same God who was willing to speak very clearly, very exactly, and enrage a crowd by pressing on them for the sin that they had coiled up in their hearts and revealing to them their sin of national pride, which led them to lead him to a hill and try to throw him off. But Jesus slipped through their midst. Why did he do that? It wasn't time for him to give his life just yet. He had to fulfill the scriptures. Fulfilling the scriptures meant taking on a cross. Oh, he'd die, but not on that day. He'd go to a cross and give his life, not just to fulfill their rage, but to fulfill the, need, the, the world's need of a savior. He'd go to a cross and he would give his life for his own people, the Jews, And for other people like Gentiles, he'd go and give his life for you. To remove the stain of all of your poor choices, give his life for me, to remove the stain of all of my poor choices too. He gave his life so that we could have a Savior and so that others could have a Savior too. Now, our best way of managing ourselves and making our choices and decisions is to think about how I can best give people the good news of our Savior. What choices can I make today and tomorrow and this week so that somebody else can know that Jesus loved them that much? God grant that for Jesus' sake. Amen.
In our prayers today, we'll remember two families who have been affected by deaths of loved ones. Um, Tracy Mettler's father, David, uh, died from this life uh, this weekend. And uh, Ron Thompson, longtime member of our congregation, beloved by so many of you, uh, he was called to heaven uh, just around midnight uh, last night. So let's go to the Lord in prayer for them and for others. O oh Lord, your people in the days of Ezra, the priest, returned to your word. They had attentive ears. They were eager to hear your word with understanding. Oh, that our days would be so sanctified and your commandments put into practice among us. Guide us into that. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, you have arranged us as members of one body in Christ Jesus. Free us from jealousy or contempt toward the fellow Christians in our midst, in our congregation, in our nation, in our world. Lead us to give honor to those who are weaker brothers, to suffer and rejoice together, and to serve in harmony as those baptized in one spirit. Lord, in your mercy, Heavenly Father, bless all families and homes that one generation may tell to the next generation the wonderful works of God in Christ. Lord, in your mercy, O oh God, give wisdom and courage to all who govern our communities and country, that they may lead well following your will rather than man's whims. Grant us willingness to support them with our prayers and encouragement. Lord, in your mercy, gracious and compassionate Lord, comfort those who mourn, especially Tracy Mettler and her family. We thank you for her father, David, and for guiding him into your heavenly home. And we ask you to grant peace and hope to Tracy and Rick and to Tracy's brothers as they grieve. And we pray for Pat Thompson and her family as you've welcomed Ron into your heaven. We thank you for the life of faith that he lived, for the many blessings that he poured out on this congregation and his community. Thank you for turning him to Jesus that he might believe in his Savior and for blessing him now with the life that Jesus has given him. As our great physician, mend the bodies and uplift the spirits of all in need. We pray today for Connie Beer's brother, David, who is in late stages of cancer. For Connie's niece, who is fighting a recurring melanoma, and for Kim during a health battle. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Oh Lord, your son has come with favor to deliver us. And in his blessed sacrament, he brings cleansing and strength. Give faith to us all, that we would not despise our Savior and his holy communion. Do not pass through us and go away as at Nazareth, but dwell among us. And graciously, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit. One God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. <clears throat> One day you'll make everything new, Jesus. One day you will bind every wound. The former things shall all pass away, no more tears. One day you'll make sense of it all. thought left behind no more fear when we all 
your glory revealed on that day. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Thanks be to God.